Hello everyone, and a very warm welcome to the uncharted waters of Season 3 of the Take a Pew podcast. I'm Ian Wishart, and following the successful completion of some pretty intense contractual negotiations over Christmas, I can confirm that I will be joined once again by Mr Simon Clark. Yes, hello listeners, it's great to be back. Hey, who'd have thought that we'd make it to season three, eh, mate? Yeah, quite. But two and a bit years and 26 spiritual pearls of wisdom later, here we are. Mm. So anyway, mate, I presume you've revolutionised the format for the new season? Well, not exactly. In fact, not even approximately. Oh, so I can keep asking a random question? Yes, sadly, you can. But there is one change for this season. Ooh, what's that, mate? Well, in season one, of course, we have the feature Tell Us, Reverend, What's, what's in Your Lunchbox? And we changed that in season two to What Would You Pick in Your Perfect Picnic? Yes, we did. And for this brand new season, we've scaled up yet again to the fabulous, miraculous, impractical, fantastical Take A Pew dinner party. Oh, brilliant. A bit like what we did with Ishmael in our Christmas special. Yes, in fact, exactly like that. Just that it's a regular dinner party, not a Christmas lunch. Right. Well, I'm looking forward to that then. I just hope you haven't come up with another ridiculous jingle. Uh, well, yes, I have. Sorry about that. Anyway, should we actually do a show, do you think, mate? Uh, yeah, yeah, we're here now. So uh, we've organised a guest, so it would be rude not to, really. Yes, it would. And we're kicking off the new season in style. We have our youngest guest so far, and it's been the longest road trip yet. Because today we are chatting with the Reverend George White, Vicar of St Wilfrid's Church in Nottingham, former rock drummer and the man who did an MA in Theology and Laughter. Wow, sounds like he was tailor-made for the show, mate. Yes, doesn't it? Let's raise the curtain on the new season. This is the Take a Pew podcast with the Reverend George White. George White! <laughs> And here we are in a place which, for us Southerners, is basically in Scotland. Uh, could you be a little more precise, mate? OK, yes. I'm just to the left of the bookcase. Uh, yeah, maybe a bit less precise than that. OK. Yes, we are in the rectory in the village of Wilford in Nottingham, which is the home of our rather marvellous guest, the Reverend George White. George, welcome to the show and please take, take a pew. pew. Thank you very much. Hello George, it's great to meet you, and might I say particularly exciting to note your collection of guitars. Perhaps you could just describe your guitars for our lovely listeners. Simon, I think you mean <laughs> perhaps George could introduce himself to our lovely listeners. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, that as well. Sorry George, please. Well hello everyone, I'm George, uh, the Reverend George White. I'm 29 years old, um, and I'm married to a wonderful woman called Kate. We have a one-year-old son called Isaiah, um, I was ordained in 2018. Um, and so I've been, been a rev for, I think, four years now. Thanks, George. And congratulations on being the first guest on season three. Thank I feel honored, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be pleased to know that we've still got most of our regular fun features in the show, aside from having upgraded our picnic to a dinner party. But we'll get to all that in due course. In the meantime, Let's embark on the George White saga. Where did life begin for you? I understand it was somewhere that smelt of onions. Somewhere that smelt of onions? Um, possibly, if it's my mother's kitchen. I'm, I'm racking my brain now <laughs> to think about our call. Anyway, well, I, I grew up in Kent. If, there we if go, that's there we any. go. So I'm, uh, I still feel like a southerner. Feel, I probably, like you guys, feel like anything north of Oxford is the north. So I feel a little yeah. bit of like a fish out of water. Um, but I grew up in a, um, a little village called Elam, uh, just near the city of Canterbury. Uh, and um, I was joking the other day that we had, uh, where we've got two celebrity connections. Apparently, Audrey Hepburn was evacuated to my village during the war. And we also went, when I was growing up there, Pam Ferris, who famously played the trunch ball. And I think Rosemary in Rosemary and Time and all kinds of other things. Um, where it lives in the village. And me and my brother, when we were kids, used to have to walk down to the shop passing the trunch ball, which was terrifying. But there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and she was originally Ma Larkin, I think, wasn't she, in The Darling oh, Buds of Me? Oh, I know you mean now. So very yeah. appropriate for the, uh, for yeah. the Kentish Absolutely. environs. Did you Absolutely. ever bump into her at all? Yeah, yeah, regularly, yeah, on a, on a dog walk or two. Yeah, she's, she's, she's lovely. Very, very, uh, very much not like her sort of trunch ball 
uh, name, which is which is nice. Anyway, there we go. Well, that was the Pam Ferris show on <laughs> Take a Few Radio. Shout out to Pam You're Ferris. Very well, yeah. Yes. So, um, so tell us a little bit about your your family mm. unit that you had. As a, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, grew up. Um, like I say in Kent and um, very fortunate my parents were together and seemed to like each other which always helps doesn't it and I had a, um, an older brother who's a year and a half older than me who would just terrorize me relentlessly growing up which is I think is what brothers do but um, but yeah I had a great time didn't grow up around church or religion so that wasn't that wasn't a part of our lives but um, but yeah great family environment which I think the older I get the more stories you hear about people's family environments the more grateful I am actually just for just for that so um, so yeah that was us that okay was, and uh, we like to take a particular slant on people's uh, <laughs> life as, as youngsters uh, by asking you this question. What were you like at school? Were you a little bit geeky? Or were you a little bit freaky? Or were you a little bit cheeky? What were you like at school? Yes, George, what were you like at school? Well, I was thinking about this and I, I would say um, I think I was charming. Now that sounds oh. slight, potentially arrogant, but it doesn't rhyme with cheeky though. You can't have it. It doesn't. No, yeah. maybe I need to rethink it. But yeah. no, I, at school, I mean, I was, I, I would say, I was the good kid who hung out with all the naughty kids, and I, I specifically remember um, getting my friends who were always getting suspended or doing naughty things at school off and out of trouble because relationally, I'd be a bit close with some of the some of the teachers. I did, I did once actually accidentally call my uh, my maths teacher in secondary school babe. Which was a slight, oh, slight yeah. boundary cross, I think. What did he that. make of that? Um, well, she was, she was, she was kind. What did he make of that? Oh gosh, yeah. But I, but I mean, I. So I, I got on with um with the teachers very well. Um, but I mean, I, I mean, I, you're talk, I mean, I was the kind of kid where I mean, the joke, the, the ongoing joke was that I'd often get on better with my friends' parents and I'd go around their house and end up talking to my friends' parents. So probably a weird kid, not geeky or naughty, but um. But no, that was that was the kind of kid I was in school. So probably quite like, quite good, but not like a total goody two shoes. And I'll have you know, actually, I want I want this stated on a podcast because this has never made it um, to the web. But it'd be nice to immortalise this fact. We had a, a big running in our sixth form. Went to quite a traditional school in, in, in Kemp, and there was a big thing every year when you were in year thirteen about who was going to be the head boy. And the staff and students voted, and then you did an interview, and then whoever the headmaster liked basically got the job. And I'll have it stated right now, Harvey, anyone listening from the Harvey Grammar School in Folkestone and Kent, that I got the most votes from staff and from students, and they didn't give me the bleeding job. So oh, there you ooh. go. It is a sore spot to this day, yeah. over 10 years later. <laughs> <laughs> Well, don't be too bitter, but uh, anyway. no, that's great. No, we'll edit that bit out anyway. Um, <laughs> Just as well. No, we won't. Of course no. we won't. Of course we won't. And yeah. uh, what about outside school? Did you have any particular things that you spent your time doing? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, unsurprisingly, I suppose, I mean, I spent all my time really in secondary school uh, doing music. So, I mean, the week was really made up of finishing school and going to band practice, which um, we, we'd do as, as, as often as we could, as often as our parents would let us. But yeah, well, but growing up, actually, when I was younger than that in primary school, um, hilariously, I, I ended up sort of skiing quite competitively. I went to a sort of a normal C of E primary school. Was everyone else village. being competitive as well, or was it just It you? might have just been me, actually. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. They didn't have a ski team before I forced them to have one. But, uh, <laughs> but we, no, we had a little um, we had a little dry slope in the local town. And so skiing was, it's so funny, when I, when I explain my primary school to people, we had an indoor pool and we did sailing and skiing. It sounds like your quintessential prep school, doesn't it? But it wasn't, I promise. But um, but so yeah, so I, so that was my big thing. And then we got to secondary school. My dad said, "Look, um, you got to choose between music and skiing because we can't afford both." Oh. And then when you're a teenager, you think music's going to get you more girls, frankly, don't you? So I committed to that. It never really really worked out that way. <laughs> <laughs> it pans out for very few of us. To, but um, yes, yeah, so that was so music was really the the main thing that was the thing that kind of um was the really the glue for my for our friend groups and that was the thing we sort of end up spending all of our time doing but um it's funny i was i was saying to someone the other day because we are going to secondary schools quite a lot with uh, with this job as you can imagine and um and i remember when i was at secondary school there were there were far more defined groups by music often so i remember you did have the kind of the kids who love rock and metal and post hardcore, they would all hang out together and the guys who like hip hop like there was quite a where I where I grew up quite a um 
yeah compartmentalization even on the playground of like you know which usually came back to music which yeah, it just doesn't really seem to exist anymore for people so what sort of stuff much. what sort of stuff were you into then at the time was it well I, well, I when i started secondary school i was introduced to metal for the first metal. time yeah, yeah when i was 11 and remember just thinking what on earth is this and so um so for a long time kind of getting into heavier music Heavy stuff, and yeah. when i started playing in bands that was what we all wanted to play and and we, it was it was awful. I looked photos back, and we all had fringes. The back of our hair was short. We had these enormous fringes down the front of our faces. It's terrible. <laughs> the things you think are cool at the time, you look back and think, "Oh my gosh." You yeah. mentioned um, you weren't part of it. Wasn't a churchy mm. environment for you growing up. But when did church come up on the horizon? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's interesting because despite us start not growing up around church, some of my looking back at it now i've only been thinking about this recently but some of my parents best mates were pretty devoted christians although they my parents never went in for it themselves and um and i only realized that recently i was actually thinking oh, it probably starts a little bit sooner than i thought um but i suppose the real moment was through music so i always make this joke that pink floyd brought me to faith because pink floyd growing up that was the thing that uh, captured my attention musically and, and that was the thing my dad used to play and that was really what got me passionate about music and then I, I sort of joked that through that I ended up wanting to play music by the time I got to secondary school I then was good enough just about to be able to play in bands and it was when I was in a band in secondary school as a guitar player who was a Christian he invited the rest of us none of the rest of us were but he invited the rest of us to this uh church camp which we all said no to immediately and then he sort of kept he kept mm -hmm. reducing the offer i realize christians do this now it's like a sales pitch isn't it but but he sort of it started off quite quite big and scary and he said well you don't really have to go to any of the meetings and there's a skate park and i mean really we could just hang out in our tents and play musical week and so he reduced it so much we thought well fair enough it's 70 quid we'll go along um, and then during that week yeah became a christian so i joke i often joke uh, to people that i i at that stage it was kind of like jesus was the uh, best hidden secret in christianity because <laughs> I'd, I'd been around some of the decoration of it and c of e primary school and singing the hymns and stuff like that but um yeah, no, I'd never really had anyone tell me about Jesus. And that, um, that you know, as I'm sure it's for most Christians, that was the game changer. Big was time, it the whole so. experience of the camp or was there one particular moment that you think that that was the moment? Oh no, the camp freaked me out. I remember going into, so it was quite a charismatic sort of, uh, uh, summer camp and I remember going into the first meeting and there were all these teenagers there was a rock band at the front so you've got to remember I'm starting from zero here so for some reason there was a rock band at the front and all these teenagers lifting their hands in the air with their eyes closed and I had no idea what was going on and I remember running out of that tent and thinking oh my gosh I'm not sure what's going on here um, and I think I went went back to the tent and at one of those gross Heinz um, beans with the sausages in oh yeah nice. lovely my yeah. favorite oh, well, i think they yeah. discontinued it now which i think is an answer to prayer but <laughs> health hazard um, yeah exactly <laughs> but um uh but yeah then across the week i mean to be honest my, my it piqued my curiosity that there was about six seven thousand people there and i thought well, you know why would all these people spend the best weeks of their summer at, you know a church camp and i thought you know either they're all all sort of you know equally deluded or maybe there's something to it and so i sort of started going into a few of the meetings and then it was on a yeah on a thursday as a woman speaking she was speaking about the gospel and who jesus was and the kind of things he did and what he said and i it was totally revolutionary to me i didn't know the songs didn't own a bible none of that stuff but heard that i thought well if that's what it's really about and this isn't some kind of hoax then you know i'll get on board with that so so that was at 14 did you say 14 yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. W wonderful and at that point presumably you decided you were going to be a vicar oh straight away yeah, yeah. no absolutely <laughs> not no that wasn't even a not even a twinkle in well i was going to say my eye in anyone's eye i don't think anyone would have expected that but um you know it wasn't a sort of damascus road experience i was still a kind of hormonal teenager so my first years of uh, church were kind of underage drinking on the saturday night and then you know going to church hungover on the sunday morning and <laughs> you know it was it was a bumpy road let's say and, and really my big passion was i was was music still so i you know I'd, I'd had this amazing sort of um discovery i suppose of jesus and had become a christian and then um really wanted to be a session musician so that was my whole focus and i was playing in bands and you know as, as i got a bit better and people around me got a bit better the bands did better and better and you know we got into one band where we were doing things on radio one and playing festivals and touring and releasing albums and getting signed and and that was really exciting um and then i was i was i was actually in another project that was doing quite well 
Um, and it, it was probably when I was uh, 18, in fact, yeah, when I was 18 years old, I started feeling that stirring towards church leadership, which I'm sure you've had many people on this podcast tell you. When that first came up, I just wanted to run a mile. I wasn't interested. It felt like a interruption to my well-laid <laughs> plans. It didn't feel like an aspiration. It feels, it feels a common response, but I know yeah. on the basis that you mentioned you're only 29 now, I don't think yeah. you should feel too bad. <laughs> I think whatever, I yeah. that long whatever yeah. comes yeah. next is certainly better than some others have done. Yeah, right. In the nicest possible sense. But yeah. um, I feel that's the next stage, but I feel that as we draw the childhood period to an end, mm. uh, we ought to ask you another question, of course, which is... <laughs> What's your fondest childhood memory? What's your fondest? What's your fondest of all your childhood memories? What's your fondest? What's your fondest? Oh. Oh. Yes. What's your fondest childhood memory? It's not that long ago for you, really, is it? But... <laughs> so, no, my fondest childhood memory is... So I remember being on a holiday and I must have been maybe five or six years old and my, um, it was summer holidays and we went to the New Forest, me, me my brother and my parents. Uh, and, uh, and the whole, the plan was we were going to the New Forest, we were having a week's holiday and then we were going back home. And on the way back home, um, we stopped off at a service station or something and my parents said, um, do you kids fancy another week's holiday? And clearly they had planned this whole other second week. Um, but the, 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 the reason it's my fondest memory is that um, my parents told me, well, the next part of the journey, we have to go to Port Stansted. And we'd never been on a plane at this point, me and my brother. And so we're in this car thinking, where the heck is this Port Stansted? And my brother being smarter than me clocked on quite quickly. And it took, I think, until we were at the gate, ready to board the plane of me realizing, Oh my goodness, we're going to go on an airplane. This hasn't been any sea for ages. And, but I, I love that. And that became sort of like a bit of a liturgy in our house talking about Port Stansted. But fond memory, extra week of holiday, going on the plane for the first time. Um, and then, yeah, I think we ended up going to Mallorca, of all places. Ooh, wonderful. My dad was happy about because I think he had a bar in the middle of the pool. So he spent most of his time there. <laughs> but yeah, that's it. that was my favourite. Um, no, that's, that's charming, to use your <laughs> word. I think I can relate to that. And we sometimes think about other other things in childhood that we might remember. But one of the things we, we think about is whether there's a particular smell that comes to mind when you think of childhood. But as you were telling that story, I, I was myself smelling the the kerosene at an airport that I can remember, Bournemouth Airport, I remember going to. Yeah. When you think of that particular memory, can you what smells come up, if any, to mind? Well, interestingly, now you say it, the... Um, that place in the new forest and that kind of smell of sort of like low level farmyard everywhere, yeah. but also kind of built up in a bit anyway. So, but no, no, you say it, I was kind of getting a bit of a whiff of that, but um, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's <laughs> it's a sensory podcast, it's good. It is. Also, yeah. do you remember like a particular plate of food at the time? Yeah, does that bring oh back memories gosh. that you used to have? So we, my mum used to do this thing, which was essentially sausage and mash, but she rebranded re sausage and mash as sausage volcano, where she would oh, cut yeah. up the sausage and put it into this lump <laughs> mash and beans with a lava around the air. anyway fantastic, but I, that fantastic. smells still when i when i cook that meal today that's uh, that's quite nostalgic for me so yeah. there you go very yeah. good so we got to um 18 or so i think mm. we're still doing some session or wanting to do some session work yeah pick up the story from from there because i presume it wasn't too long after that that something changed yeah so i so i had planned basically to move to brighton to um uh, study songwriting actually so i was due to move down to brighton to do that um, and had gone down had sort of um, had all the conversations that was all the ducks were in a row as it were and that was when I felt this call to Christian ministry so it really felt like a whole U-turn on that plan um, and as, as often the way I, I find you know when you say you know um, when God's nagging you about something you finally say yes to it uh, you sort of expect the next bit of information to come straight <laughs> away and then you think oh I don't know what to do now and like I mean in reality it was from that point to when I actually um, moved to London to study theology it was really only a year but when you're a teenager, it feels like about a decade, doesn't it? Well, I mean, a year's nothing now. But um, so I so I took a year out and um, tried to figure out what the heck this was going to look like. And I was in a little Baptist church in Kent. And at this point, Church of England wasn't really a part of part of my um, my world. And and, and I had an amazing year. Paul, you know, Paul Pints in the local town. Tried to figure out what what was going to be gonna come next. And had amazing people at my church. And I ended up going to India. Um, I went to a 
a church in the United States called Bethel, which has got quite well known now through music and preaching and that kind of stuff. And then ended up in Israel as well. A couple at the church had a dream to send me to Israel. And so with spending money, I was like, yeah, no, I think that's the Lord's. <laughs> it was like, so I went off for that as well. And, um, and then, yeah, it was during that time that basically I, I, I said, well, no, this is, you know, this, I've got to do something about this. And so I remember typing into Google, uh, universities that offer theology. And I just applied for the first three. Like, it was like, uh, Oxford, Aberdeen and um, London. And uh, I ended up at a little Jesuit college in London. Um, yeah, and that was, that was really where, that's how I got to London. And that was really sort of my first connection with um, the Anglican church. Through that, people began sort of asking, oh, have you ever thought about being ordained to the Church of England? Yeah, so okay. you, so you did a theology degree, and then you, did you carry straight on with ordination training? So yeah, so yeah. so I so I basically uh, moving to London. I went to this uh, uh, this charming little Anglican church called HTB, um, and <laughs> yeah. uh, and that's basically you know through that ended up on this sort of exploration process. Um, so and that coincided with me finishing my undergraduate degree. So finished that and then went straight to vicar school at oh, St. So you were, you were fully on track by this point. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I was on board. I was yeah. you know, in for a penny, in for a pound. So, <laughs> so ended up, yeah, at St. Malice, I know some of your other guests um, went to St. Malice. Yeah, it's quite popular. Them. Does a good job. Yeah, so that, that was it. And that was when I did the MA. Because I know you referenced earlier yes. the MA on theology. Well, and I heard a vicious and... rumour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does. Weird doesn't make you funny, by the way. Writing yeah. academically on a subject doesn't mean that you know. So I sort of thought oh, I'll do this MA on theology of laughter and humour, and then I'll be really funny. And it never quite happened that way. But my thesis, my dissertation for that MA was all around yeah. Laughter, what was the, what drove humor. that then? Why? Well, I did my undergrad. Interestingly, so um, one of the things I haven't mentioned uh, is so I lost. Uh, both my parents at reasonably young age. So my mum died when I was nine. Um, and actually really, I mean, it probably worth mentioning, I, I, in some ways I think that sort of spiritual awakening in our family started with her because about a year before she died, she became a Christian, literally in a hospital room. Um, and then my dad died when I was 20, after a year after I moved to London. And he, three months before he died, had become a Christian um, at our dining table whilst Antiques Roadshow was playing. So it's all <laughs> miraculous wow. and mundane, wow. you know, it's mm. kind of, um, but, um, but the reason, the, so the reason I mentioned all of that is because then when I, when I finished uni, I did my undergraduate dissertation on the book of Job. So it was all about suffering and lament and, um, and all that kind of stuff. And then, and I had had this strange thing where I, you know, all of us have experienced suffering, but I'd experienced quite an acute period of suffering, but I'd always, you know, it always been described as a joyful person, always, you know, had a sense of humor and i was just i was interested in how those two things fit together and and i remember someone saying that those who have suffered much know how to smile and yeah. there and the connection i don't know maybe there was something about that having gone to the extreme of suffering at one end to then do the thesis on laughter at the other um maybe for me on some level i was trying to kind of reconcile those two things in myself and um I've only just had that thought now. But yeah. yeah. What were your main <laughs> What were your main conclusions then from that the thesis? Well, so so I mean, C.S. Lewis got this wonderful phrase, which I think sort of sums it up, which is that he says, uh, "Joy is the serious business of heaven." Which I just love the paradox of that quote. And but this this idea, I mean, joy is all over scripture. It's all over the sort of Christian history. And and I think you know we it's one of those things, particularly in church, that can be theoretical. Your know, person starts the service, you know, shout to the Lord for joy. Or the, but actually, what does joy look like? The joy of heaven. How does that embody itself? And often it embodies itself in laughter and humour and, and, you know, not least what you guys are doing, uh, you know, with this podcast. And and so my, really, the, the, the main conclusion with, if, you know, because otherwise you got, I'm otherwise going to be here for ages, kind <laughs> of uh, pretentiously talking through my MA thesis. But the main conclusion was that as Christians, we can laugh and no joy because the story isn't over all the bad things will be made good like it's not over is it you know and we can laugh we've got reason to laugh because darkness and death and all that stuff doesn't have the final word um that was really yeah. that was the main thing yeah. a bit Hallelujah. more involved than that yeah, yeah, amen. 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 yeah absolutely it's not even your pearl of wisdom bit yet no, oh, no. It's, it's, on. Yeah, okay. that's great and I do think it's, I, mm. I think laughter's good, isn't it? Mm. And um, even reading, I read, believe it or not, read the whole of Mark's Gospel yesterday, sort of speed wow. read Mark's Gospel. Um, only took 45 minutes, by the way, listeners, if you fancy reading a Gospel, <laughs> it's, it's a great one. Love it. But I laughed several times. It sounds ridiculous. I won't tell you which bits I laughed at, but there are bits that I think I laugh out loud, really. And yet sometimes when we, when we put it in the sort of the, uh, the context of uh, something church and sacred, we sort of think, oh, am I allowed to? 
am I allowed to find God <laughs> funny? And it's just like, no, of course you are, you know. Um, anyway, anyway. Yeah, good yeah. stuff. Well, what a yeah. great MA. I look forward to reading the whole thesis <laughs> uh, in Duke. It's on the shelf just behind you. Ian, <laughs> Absolutely, so. yeah. <laughs> Send you home with it. Yeah. So St. Melitus, mm. and then into security. Yep, yeah, so moved to Nottingham. That was, that was the Nottingham connection. So right. we had some friends who... Uh, one of them, one of the guys was our, mine and my wife's student pastor when we were at HDB. And he was a couple of years ahead of me at Vicar School. Um, and they were at HDB kind of in London and then got asked about planting a church up here in Nottingham. And, that, and we basically but loved these guys and always had this dream of that if there was ever a chance to, you know, help lead a church with them, we'd love to do it. And the opportunity came up and it just so happened. I mean, just sort of little factoid, but it just so happened that my bishop in the, the area of London I was in, um, a few years prior had just become Bishop of Nottingham. So that was the other connection as well. And so that was it. Yeah, so we moved up really to sort of help these guys lead, lead this church in the city centre. And that was how we ended up in East Midlands. And then moved to not that far away from, from there now, I guess. No, not far at all. No, and you've been here now for as as a proper vicar, or I guess you're a rector if you live in a rectory. Well, you? hilariously, I'm a vicar who lives in a rectory. Oh. My friend in Lincoln is a rector who lives in a vicarage. So, oh, okay. Well, as no. you say, it's I say I say hilarious. Yes, it's, 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 it's hilarious. Funny. There's nothing funny about that, is there? It's, anyway. that, that'll, that'll be the comedic highlight. <laughs> yeah, you have to of sing the, the series, I think. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. That was a, yeah. That was a stretch, though. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so we've been in nine months. Yeah, in this Vic, vic victory. Victory. Is that where we're, victory. <laughs> we're in the victory, yeah, not the, the victory. rectory, yeah. not the victory. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's you good. should call it the victory. Absolutely, yeah. It's good. Nice. And I'm quite pleased with that. <laughs> <laughs> Trademark it now. Yeah, yeah. It. yeah that's very good. Right. So anyway, whatever whatever the job title, yeah. you've been here about nine months, I think. Nine months now, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. How's it going? How are you finding it? It's good. You know, it's wonderful. I mean, and the, I mean, the learning curve has been pretty vertical. So, you know, we, we, this is a almost thousand year old parish here with all the kind of trappings of that that kind of parish ministry so we've got a very old church building and lots of lots of potential but it's so different for everything i've done you know so the church you're at before was a old auction house that was done up into kind of a, a, a developed into sort of a new church space and even when i was in london i was always involved in slightly more experimental versions of church so the learning curve has been pretty vertical being a sort of a proper parish vicar now but um no we're loving it absolutely loving it and it's um it's nice, you know, it's, it's, it's really nice being in a, having done city centre stuff for so much, being in a place where lots of people actually live. And that's, which we've got about 8,000 people here, but um, it's mainly residential. And that's actually really exciting, you know, because you do the city centre stuff and it, it's fun in a different way, but it's quite transient, particularly in London and, you know, city centre anywhere. People kind of come and go, don't necessarily live close by. So it's a whole different thing, but no, we're loving it. Absolutely loving it. We had a, brought a little team with us from, uh, did a did a bit of a graft here and so brought a little team with us along some of our favorites and yeah great yeah just still still feel like we're getting our feet under the table to be honest like still kind of getting used to it all but um it's kind of nostalgic for me because um the, this little bit where we're, where we're in right now is quite villagey despite it being um in the city it does feel quite a lot like a village so um and it sort of reminds me a little bit where i grew up so because we've got you know we've got people who've uh, been in the church a really really long time in the 70s and 80s now we've got new uh, young people are coming and young adults young couples and then we've got people who did come to this church became christians here had gone to other church in the city but have come back felt they want to come back here but they're, they're amazing so kind encouraging and yeah, it's good. Great. Yeah. Do, you, do you get to play any music in the church environment? Not so much anymore. Yeah. I just, I, just was, like, I didn't want to be one of those try hard vicars who sort of, you know, <laughs> like, you know, doing a bit of music, then doing the sermon, and it comes, comes a bit of a work, one man yeah. band. I had a bit of a vision of that when I was training and I was at a church and I used to lead worship there and I played play guitar and they did a Mumford and Sons and had a bass drum, a tambourine, used to play sort of keyboard pad sounds from an iPad. And I mean, it was like, that gave me a vision of the one man band thing. I was like, oh, I'm not sure I'm, I'm up for that. But um, anyway, so no, don't do loads here, but still do music outside of, outside of church. So, sounds, yeah. sounds great fun. And do you pursue any interest outside running your parish? I mean, music's the main one and I don't want to, don't want to sort of, uh, for everyone i mean the other one honestly is cooking we love cooking okay. me and my wife um probably you know i my my, my dad always used to say never trust a thin chef uh, and i'm a chubby chef so you can <laughs> you can trust my opinion on that but it's you know, we love it master chef and just you know we often bond over just cooking delicious food and anyway we love that 
Great. <laughs> You're a good chef here, aren't you? But, yeah. uh, well, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> 90 seconds at 900 watts, that's all I know. That's my, <laughs> that's my cooking technique. Pop and, and big, um, yeah. <laughs> and actually, as you, as you mentioned cooking, George, I can mm. see the staff are just setting the table for the mm. inaugural Take a Pew dinner party. So that must mean, of course, that it's time for us to brush the dust off the box of the little game we like to call My Favourite Things. My Favourite Things. <laughs> yes, new season, same simple game, George. We present you with a range of categories and you tell us your favourite thing in each. Yes, as easy. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> yes, as easy as something that's very easy. And our first category is still always your favourite book of the Bible. Um, Isaiah, Isaiah. My son's called Isaiah, so I feel like I've got to say that as well. But there you go. That's my favourite. <laughs> very good. Yeah. I think that's allowable. Yeah, you have to go in, uh, New Testament. Um, New Testament. I would probably say Matthew's Gospel. Yeah, which I remember someone once saying that Matthew's Gospel was like, you know, for people who love watching long, boring documentaries. <laughs> I, I disagree. I love it. Interesting. Yeah, well, good. having just read Mark's, I'm looking forward to Matthew now. Yeah, that's, that's like the Marvel uh, yeah. Marvel movie of the Gospels. You know, punchy, <laughs> like action-packed. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Yeah, very good. Anyway, but Isaiah, good okay. choice. Good, good choice. choice. Yeah. Try this one then, George. Your favourite type of stone? My favourite type of stone? Uh, oh, what? Marble. Marble. Can I say marble? Well, you said you marble. Say what you oh, like. marble. Marble. Marble, yeah, marble. marble. I don't know why that popped into my head. <laughs> got no real connection to marble, apart from marble runs. But yeah, no, marble's a good stone, isn't it? Yeah, it's a good stone, isn't it? I like marble. It's nice, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Depends what you want it for, doesn't it? Do you know, I um, found out recently, Beryl. Beryl's a stone. Oh, yeah. Beryl. And it's in the Bible, so Beryl technically is a biblical name. Yeah, oh, yeah, Beryl. I know. Yeah. Oh, what, what, yeah. Okay. Factoid. That's that <laughs> is nice. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe yeah. I should have chosen Beryl. Missed the chance there. Yorkstone. Yeah, I like nice. Yorkstone. Yeah, a bit of yeah. patio paving. Bit of limestone. That's it's, quite nice. It's, it's quite a wide yeah. category. Well, I mean, it's yeah. one for you yeah. to raise, mate. I yeah, no thanks. A Thank lot you. of mileage in that. Yeah. It's nice to meet people so passionate about stone. It's yeah, nice. yeah. It was, well, it didn't. There was no stony silence, was there? Hey! hey. hey. Yeah. Yeah, Moving it's, swiftly on. Yeah, it's getting a bit rocky now. Hey! Um, so, so our, third, that's terrible. our third category. Uh, this season, everyone will be pleased to know, is still, because we think there's so much mileage in it, it's still going to be your top five films. Top five films. Now, I'm sure that someone must have asked you this before, and I'm just going to be contrary and annoy you and ask it again anyway. Ooh. Can I have Lord of the Rings as one? Because yes. it's a trilogy. Yes. I can yeah. have Lord of the Rings you as one. Yes. one. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, so that, that goes up there, because no matter how many times I've watched it, I never get bored of watching that. And I we used to have a yearly Lord of the Rings marathon when I was growing up. <laughs> um, and I found actually a couple of friends of mine who live in the parish um, who are in their 50s told me the other day they'd never seen the films. And so I promptly organised two days where we watched through the, all of the films. <laughs> there you go. So yeah, Lord of the Rings. Yeah, that's that's, okay, that's one. Okay. Yeah, I think someone's had that as one before. There's a, um, there's a film called Her, which came out... Um, Oh. Uh, maybe maybe even five six years ago now with uh, Joaquin Phoenix um, and it's about it's sort of slightly um, in the future um, but it's essentially kind of you know Siri artificial intelligence like that that sort of being pretty much perfected and this guy ends up sort of falling in love with his oh, but anyway I mean it oh, right. sounds no. like it but it is an amazing film and I, I I remember saying pretentiously to my wife I had to finish with it Oh, that's a very important film. She laughed her head <laughs> off. She said, what are you talking about? A very important film. But I, I, I stand by it. It is. I would really recommend that, particularly in our sort of... Uh, H so H-E-R. H-E-R. It's just yeah, called H-E-R. Yeah, okay, okay. Check that out. Definitely. It's amazing. Um, and then I'd probably say... Um, so the first film I remember being really inspired by uh, was a... A Matthew McConaughey film called A Time to Kill mm. which was a courtroom type thing and and I remember long even before I was a Christian I ever thought about being a vicar um, that was the thing that really made me passionate about um like public speaking like some of the some of the some of the uh, I remember watching that film and just being like oh my gosh the power of someone putting a sentence together well and that anyway so I loved that film growing up um, he's very good Matthew McConaughey though he's, yeah he's, all right all right, all right. Yeah. Yeah. I love him a lot <laughs> I can listen to that man he does lots of audiobooks now doesn't he he's got that lovely southern accent anyway there you go um, and then 
I'm go- I'm gonna put it in there. Notting Hill. It's a great film. It is a great film. I'm just saying. I was saying something the other day. Like we just don't make good English rom coms like that anymore. Not in 1999 we had Notting Hill. 2003 we had Love Actually, and I don't think we've had anything that good since. This is my opinion. I I I kind of agree with you. Actually, I think my top five. Um, not that anyone's ever asked me. Well, I've asked you once. <laughs> oh. no, I, I think I would probably include four weddings and a funeral. Yeah, in that's my a, top, yes. just yeah. because of it was of the time similar that era sort of brand, as well. and it's the yeah. same genre isn't it really it's Notting yeah, Hill yeah. So and, not, uh, not, it's good Notting Hill to get a shout because actually a recent episode we did was actually in Notting Hill and Notting Hill the film didn't get a mention in the top five I don't know how no, that terrible. No, no, no. terrible terrible absolutely yeah. um, so what have I got have I got four there I think that's four isn't it that is four yeah that's yeah. four yeah. so one more I'm gonna I'm, I'm sorry I'm gonna go for Trilogy again The Dark Knight no sorry sorry scratch that I'm gonna go <laughs> my last one is a film called Elizabeth Town um, which um, it was one of those weird ones I watched where the TV was still going at like 2am and it was on Channel 4 or something and I ended up waking up in the early hours watching this whole film um, and it is it is Orlando Bloom and Kirsten Dunst it's about a guy who's like this a prodigy at making shoes or working for Nike or something and he la- and they put all this money behind him to launch his product and it falls flat on its face so he's really depressed and then finds out his dad dies and does a big road trip if you type it in on Google the critics hate it which is why I always want to mention this because I think <laughs> it's absolutely brilliant but um, I've yet to find anyone who agrees with me so there you go there's my, there's my five Elizabeth Town that's good so, yeah. so if push came to shelf because mm-hmm. we're going to do do a VAR on this because you know some would say you have to take your first answer but yeah you've got the tr- you can watch the Batman trilogy or Elizabeth Town you're going to go Elizabeth Town eh? that's hard that's you're not fair. Put that's, that's, not, that's one unkind. side ah uh, no I probably would take Batman oh, I would yeah. take Batman yeah. I mean, it's got it's just got more my I mean it's a great movie Elizabeth Town for yeah. you know but no it's got to be Batman okay so, so we're, I've, we're, I've got to show my son these films at some point yeah, and, you know true. I can't leave Batman out of his life so well <laughs> they both had good mentions so I think we've uh, achieved that purpose. absolutely so that's great right so now with our penultimate category it's our pleasure to introduce you to the great eight so eight quick fire categories to help us gain an insight into the person that is George White. Yes. So first, your favourite author or book apart from the Bible? Favourite author or book? Um, I'm going to say Tolkien. Yeah, J.R. Tolkien. Thought that might be the case. Good one. Okay. Favourite type of food? Curry. Indian. <sighs> hot, mild, medium? Oh, hot. Always. Chicken salon, bishwari naan, pilau yeah. rice, poppadoms, Excellent. Bar, Excellent. Perfect. Favourite television programme? Uh, Lewis. Oh, nice. <laughs> okay, favourite sport? Skiing. Favourite band? Pink Floyd. Nice. Oh, nice. What a quality answer for a, for a 29 year old. <laughs> I feel this is kind of inversely ageist, this conversation. <laughs> it, it is a bit, isn't it? <laughs> she never told you my age. Wait, but I, yeah, 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 yeah. I apologise. <laughs> Okay, sorry. Come Favorite on. holiday destination? Um, the Elster Valley, uh, the Alps, basically the Alps. in Italy. Yeah. Favorite chocolate bar? Double decker. Oh, great choice. Ooh. I like these. How do you eat them? Do you take the top bit off first, or do you just eat it all? No, the time? no, no. They, they, they have scientists have engineered that to be the perfect consistency of everything in a bite. And I, uh, you're one of those people take it apart. I'm, I'm aren't weird, you? aren't I? Yeah, I'm weird. My brother okay. does the same. I always have a yeah. go in fact. No, I just right. eat it. I just eat it like a normal person. Cool, cool. Okay, <laughs> last one. Last one. Favorite board game? Um, Trivial Pursuit. Difficult yeah. one, actually. Wasn't yeah, it? yeah, tough one. Now. Think about it. Yeah. Very good. I, I think you did pretty well there, George. Well done. And in final category, it's always multiple choice. Uh, and I think we've established that drums play a part in your life. And you have an impressive array of Tom Toms. So we'd like to know your favourite Tom. There are three possible. I'll give you three possible answers. The tenuous link is just perfect. It's so good. I knew this would be good. I didn't think I'd laugh this much. This is brilliant. So three possible answers. Uh, The popular condiment Tom Arto ketchup. The popular single-handed axe. The Tom a hawk. Or the popular day, Tom Morrow. Favourite Tom? Um, oh, Tom Hawk. Tom Hawk. Yeah, we do a, lot of, Hawk. do a lot of fire pits now, so I need to chop wood. It's a new thing in my life, so appreciate a decent axe. Yeah, so you <laughs> take a Tom Hawk over tomorrow. Well, Absolutely. That's good. Yeah. 
But uh, well, I think Simon that that is the best, <laughs> my favourite score so far this season. It must be, mustn't it? it? It's definitely it up there, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's got to be. Uh, it, it is with great flourish and fanfare that that brings us to the new centerpiece of the show. It's the fabulous take a beaut dinner party. The miraculous take a beaut dinner party. The food is quite irrelevant, and some of the guests are on. It's the impractical, fantastical take a beaut dinner party. <clears throat> Yes, the fabulous Take a Pew dinner party. <laughs> <laughs> what was the cow doing at the end? What was happening we'll there? We'll find out in a minute. It'll all become oh clear. Oh my gosh. <laughs> the fabulous Take a Pew dinner party. The food's quite irrelevant and some of the guests are a little odd. Now, as this is the first time we've had a dinner party on the show, we'll explain exactly how this works. Yes, you have the privilege, George, of hosting the dinner party. You have gathered all of your friends and family as you would like to be there, but there remain four empty chairs. Yes, and you must fill these seats with the following. Firstly, any person from history, living or dead. Well, uh, but they will be brought back to life for the party, obviously. It would be bad etiquette, I think, to have a corpse at the table. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I thought that would have come without saying, mate. <laughs> anyway, that's the first chair. The second chair is for a cartoon character. The third chair is for a non-domesticated animal. And on the last chair, there's a gramophone player. Remember those? And you have to choose one piece of music which must be played continuously and repeatedly at high volume throughout the dinner. So just a fairly regular soiree, George, I think you'll agree. <laughs> Normal Saturday night here yeah. in Wilford, yeah, okay. absolutely. Right, so let's fill up those seats, because... It's the fabulous take a beaut dinner party. The miraculous take a beaut dinner party. The food is quite irrelevant and some of the guests are hot. It's the impractical, fantastical take a beaut dinner party. <laughs> oh, anyway, and so, seat number one, any person from history. Now, there's one caveat here. It can't be anyone from your own family or anyone who appears in the Bible. So, seat number one for me, and maybe this is a bit of a classic vicar answer, but I really mean it because I've thought quite hard about this. I would have St. Francis of Assisi. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, partly because... He's one of those joyful, uh, he always strikes me as a joyful saint. Um, you know, he's, he, he, go, he went off dancing in the snow, didn't he? And singing to the trees and all that. So, yeah. And he's my favourite saint. And he might come in handy with the non-domesticated animal. Yeah, though, exactly. Yeah. Well, exactly. Yeah, there's, so, a, there's a yeah. link there. Who knows? Absolutely. Who else did you have on your list of options? Um, William Wilberforce was up there. I had um, Sid Barrett, actually. Oh, um, oh. from Pink Floyd. Pink I mean, Floyd not Floyd. super historical, but you know what I'm saying. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's fine. Um, who else was there? Um, Van Gogh. He seems like an interesting guy. Might be a bit intense, though. Do you, do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, like, he yeah. might sort of bring things down a bit with his... Yeah. He'd have to keep repeating and... everything as well. Absolutely. Yeah, he would, he would. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whoever was yeah. sitting on his left or right, I can't remember which one he <laughs> yeah, shut off. Yeah. But... Adam? <laughs> Come on, Vince. Was that your bank just... off? <laughs> that was my bank Very off. Good. You've got to make a sample of that and play that now on the programme. Pardon? 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 <laughs> oh, just being ridiculous now. Right. Um, right, come on. St. Be... Francis it is. Yeah, okay. No, that's good. Good. Oh, that's Very good. good. Okay. So, secondly, a cartoon character. Can we count Paddington Bear in this? Mm, yes. Is I he a it. cartoon character? Well, I think... Mm, so no cartoon... Mm, they've had animated... It's yeah. an illustrated book, isn't it? And then he's sort of animated in a film I think and can, the television yeah. I think I think we can I think can we count did. that yeah I mean, so I, I mean yeah, I Paddington so. I mean he is yeah you know maybe it's a classic but he is um he's just social glue that yeah. bear can get along with anyone so no matter who I, I sort of thought you know depending on who else at the table you really need someone that can you know bring that you know if St Francis goes off dancing in the snow and my my family and friends get into an argument yeah, Paddington be, I feel like would, would bring something out he could bring so. it back couldn't he shaping yeah. up nicely just St Francis of Assisi and Paddington, Paddington. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah. it's, it's going very well. But uh, for the third chair, a non-domesticated animal, so it can't be a cat or a dog. Mm, or it's a panda for me. I know panda. that means I know that means you've got two bears at the table. Pandas yeah. are my favourite animals in the world. You know, because usually you watch a nature show. And, you know, you think, oh, you know, this animal's really cute and fluffy. And then you talk to someone who knows and they're like, no, actually, in the wild, they're fearsome. Pandas, yeah. no. You know, you watch a panda, seems cute. They are actually that docile and ridiculous. I'd have a panda there, up, just just chilling out, slouched down, maybe doing a few front rolls. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so and finally, you've got the piece of music that's playing on and on repeatedly throughout. Now, I might, if I t if I tell you what it is, because it's quite pretentious, can I tell you why? So you don't completely write me off. So the piece of music I'd have is four minutes thirty three seconds by John Cage. Because now, for those of you who don't know, if you're listeners who don't know, four four minutes thirty three seconds by John, Cage, I think was something he did in the fifties, and it and he sat the orchestra down, and the entire piece tells the orchestra to play not a single note, and that it was this experimental thing, and the noise, the music was the environment the orchestra were in. I want it because I can't do background music, oh, and I, I, I'm, I'd be interested to see your thoughts on this. So I, I'm one of those people where I remember at school, you know, kids would like listen to music whilst they're working. Could never do that if something's on in the car and we're not really listening to it. I have to turn it off. Like if I'm listening to something, I'm in. Like I'm listening to the album. I'm like really, literally listening to what's going on. Like background music, I can't really, can't really do it. Interesting. So I would have yeah. silence yeah. It's, it's at a, my dinner yeah. party. It's a brilliant choice. It's a, I mean, you having said that, I might now have to ban it from anyone else saying it. Because <laughs> otherwise, is, yeah. everyone's going to say, oh, I listened to that George boat, and he had yeah, a brilliant choice. Oh, thank you very much. That's thank that's you, a, what can I say? It was a trick answer. I don't think you have a trick answer. You I know, I trick. thought, is it going to be no, a bit too was, contrary yeah. to say brilliant. it? But it's true. And the other end of that scale, coincidentally, I yesterday saw on social media of some kind, the score for a piece of music called Tinnitus which was just a continuous <laughs> semitone apart, high, screechy sound. Oh, no. Which uh, I thought that was... It. But in between tinnitus... So you wouldn't want to play that through an entire dinner party. Oh, oh gosh. No, no. Yeah, um, brutal. But the opposite. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think that's a good answer. I'm tempted to ask if you had to have something that did make a sound, what would it did be? Did make a sound. Uh, it'd probably be... I'd tell you what it'd be. It'd be it'd be Shine On, the live version. This is by Pink Floyd, Shine On You Crazy Diamond. The live version from Echoes. I think they recorded at Kensington Olympia. Oh, yeah. Because the intro is seven minutes before Dave Gilmore starts singing. The whole thing, I think, is about 40. So you only need to play it like five times and that's your dinner party over. <laughs> good, good shout. Because I feel like if yeah. it's shorter, right, it would get a bit monotonous. So you need something quite long. You need yeah. a bit of a prog rock song. You could have gone for a Bach symphony or something, of course. Can yeah, you? I'm not that. I'm just not that middle class, Ian. <laughs> so like, I'm just... <laughs> Could have gone for one of your jingles, Ian. On Says he, he was quoted four minutes, 33 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> well, George, I think that that would provide an exquisite evening of convivial chat. Well, it's very good indeed. Mm -hmm. Impractical and fantastical indeed, but fabulous nonetheless. And as the staff clear away the dishes and escort the guests to their carriages, we can settle down in front of the fire and pick up on the George White story. We've looked at what you've been up to thus far, but now it's time to take a look ahead as we ask you... 12 years from now What would you like to be doing? Or would it mainly be the same? Or would you rather be canoeing for a summer? Yes, yeah, just an example. <laughs> yes, George, what would you like us to be talking about if we were doing the show 12 years from now? Mm. Well, you'd be in Lambeth Palace in London. Um, <laughs> uh, that's a joke, I promise, that's a joke. Um, what would you like to be talking about? Um, well, I'd be more anecdotes about probably my, my nine children. Ooh. That's a joke. My mum was one of nine, but I don't have much of an ambition for that. Gosh, but I, 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 I've never been very good at these questions, but... I'd love to be talking about, um, so I was saying something the other day that sometimes, you know, outside of the vicar world, doing a lot of music stuff and writing a lot of songs and performing stuff and making records about God, but that don't really fit into the sort of Christian world in that sense. Um, and then being a vicar on the other, I, so you can sometimes feel like a little bit of an exile in both worlds sometimes. I sometimes feel like a, a, a vicar who sort of st stood a little bit on the threshold of culture and in culture, I'm not quite that enough because it's quite spiritual. Anyway, 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 so I'm feeling a little bit in the middle, get your violin out, feeling a little bit of an exile of both of them. But I'd love to be talking about um, how those two things 
interact. I'd love, I'd love us to be talking about something that's happening in the world where the gospel sort of heard as good news again. So, so I, apparently I heard this because you mentioned Bach. So I'm just going to, I'm going to say this, but apparently Nietzsche, who, you know, famously was not the biggest fan of God. He said after listening to um, one of Bach's symphonies, he said, one who has forgotten Christianity completely, hears it again as gospel in the music of Johann Sebastian Bach. And I love that quote. And I sort of think, man, if like, if I can do anything to contribute to that sense of people being able to hear the gospel again as good news, uh, where it's become a bit numb or a bit sterile, um, I'd love to be talking about that and rolling out all of these testimonials of how that's happened. But there you go. Somewhere in Lambeth yeah. Palace. <laughs> <laughs> well, we wish you every yes. blessing, George, wherever life and the Lord may take you. And that brings us to the final series of regular features of the show, returning for another season. Yes, in a moment, George, we hope that you will share your spiritual pearl of wisdom. But just before that, of course, it's the part of the show that we call... Is it true? Is it true? Is it true? Is it true? Yes, is it true? And this time we have heard the theory that Jesus was actually not intending to reveal himself to be the son of God at all, seeking to live a relatively quiet life in sunny Nazareth. And indeed he did pretty well until he reached his 30s. By this time, he had established a close group of friends who seemed to follow him everywhere. And when Jesus was invited to accompany his mother to a family wedding in a neighbouring village of Cana, Jesus' friends tagged along. Now, these unexpected guests meant that the wine ran out and, presumably feeling some responsibility, Mary suggested that Jesus could miraculously solve the problem. Jesus, of course, said to his mother, Woman, what's this got to do with us? Clearly vexed that this could blow his cover. You know I'm meant to be keeping a low profile. But in the end, he relented. Turned the water into wine, caused quite a stir, and the rest, as they say, is history. But the theory is that that was never the plan. So, Reverend George White. Is it true? 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 <laughs> no idea. is it is it true is it true that the miracle at the wedding of Cana was uh, an unintended yeah yes. well he was trying to thing. trying to keep below the radar yeah, not yeah, you know it wasn't the plan for him to come out as the son of god you know yeah, so. interesting but interesting. Um, i don't know whether mary had you know had a couple of glasses of wine and says oh jesus can sort that problem so, man what are you doing sure. yeah i remember mm. i remember i remember uh, uh, uh someone once saying to me you know this is I love that you know Jesus does this miracle because his mum tells him to, which I always thought was quite, <laughs> quite funny. But I, I am, um, I'm going to say no. Um, uh, I'd now like to spend 90 minutes talking about the doctrine of providence, um, and we're going to start with Karl Barth in the 1940s. <laughs> okay. So um, no, I'm only, I'm only kidding. <laughs> but I, I'm going to say um, I'm going to say not true, and partly because I heard someone say recently, and I and I, I think I like the idea that this links up as well. That in the Genesis count. You've got, you know, creation, you've got the world being created, and then on the sixth day, you've got man and woman being created. Uh, man's created, there's their rest, and then on the basically they've worked out that it's basically the third day of the week that the first marriage happens where Adam and Eve are kind of together, right? And they realise that, you know, because in John's Gospel, he's drawing on Genesis saying, you know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. So you've got the first day, you then um, got on, you got the second day in terms of, John's gospel, literal second day of what Jesus, Jesus is doing. And then on the third day is the wedding at Cana. And so they were basically making the point just as in the first marriage, this idea of God dwelling with people in the Garden of Eden and talking with them and chatting with them in the cool of the day. So on the third day, purposefully in John, you've got Jesus again at the center of a wedding, um, uh, blessing it and, you know, getting everyone booze. <laughs> so I'm going to say not true, purely on the basis yeah. that... Um, that in the weird and wonderful providential thing of God, I, I think that I think he wanted to do it and it was purposeful. But there you go. Excellent. Is that a good enough that's answer? Do well, I, pass? Answer. I think it's probably the very good best answer. answer we've had, I think. <laughs> and uh, welcome to Theology Today. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Oh man. Pardon? It's all right, Vincent. <laughs> Keep up. Oh, dear. 
<laughs> but you know, excellent. Well, thank you for setting us straight on that one, George, and to to restore some theological balance from my session at least. Perhaps you would bless us with your spiritual pearl of wisdom. It's a spiritual pearl of wisdom. Wonderful. So my spiritual pearl of wisdom comes from a quote that I first heard a friend of mine, Mark, say, and it stuck with me. And he said, God is not impatient for your perfection, but jealous for your attention. And I love that phrase because for me, that sums up so much of what I think the gospel is about and why I've ended up uh, in this weird and wonderful adventure of being a vicar. Because the gospel isn't about us having it all together, having it all right, polishing up, knowing the religious language, knowing sort of how to do church. It's about us coming simply hungry for God and realizing that, you know, at the heart of it all, despite all the hundreds of books that have been written, despite all of the scriptures that have been read, despite all of the Christian albums and paraphernalia, um, at the heart of the gospel is a loving father who, just like in the prodigal son, is calling uh, his kids home. And I love the idea that just like a father, um, God is more interested in us in our being with him, more interested in us knowing him um, and speaking to him than he is in us having everything right. And I think what a transformative thought when it comes to prayer, when it comes to trying to live out your Christian faith, God is not impatient for our perfection, but jealous for our attention. There you go. It's a spiritual of Thank you very much for that, George. And that brings us to something that is as inevitable and possibly as painful as at some point standing on an upturned plug in bare feet. And that is the utter tripe that is... Simon, what's your random question for George? Well, George, I genuinely have a sensible question for you. Yeah, well, we've heard that one before, Simon. No, no, it really is this time. Honest. We've already thought about people from history and we've looked at 12 years from now. My random question for you, George, is this. If you could go back in time to experience any period of 12 minutes in history, what shoes would you wear? Wow. I would. Uh, <laughs> it's just so profound, Simon. It's so <laughs> profound. Thanks. Honestly. I'm just being Cheers. pensive Cheers. because, you know, revealing the question. <laughs> you really had me for a second there. Um, I, would, I would go back to the third century wearing ski boots and just trying to see if anyone could figure out what on earth was happening can you imagine seeing those on someone's feet and which is weird they're not comfortable you can't really walk around in them so wouldn't be able to get very far so you'd mainly do yeah. that just for this so you've got this opportunity to go back 12 minutes any time so you, you would take the third century just for the shock value of ski boots. my usual answer to this is i'd i'd, I'd want to go back to the wild west you know kind of but given the shoe factor would you still go back to the world best with ski boots though? You... I mean, that can still be fun, but it's just, you know, enough. shoes have developed a little yeah, bit by that point. So maybe it's yeah. not as shocking. No. That's I true. just, I think, I think it, it, the, the thought of um, people's reaction to that just makes me chuckle. So I think, I mean, we yeah. could go even earlier. Yeah. Mesopotamia with ski boots. Quite fun. Either that or a pair of Air Jordans. Imagine going with a pair of Nike pumps just in yeah. Jesus' day. Well, people wouldn't know what's going on. Yeah, and then you have to explain the NBA and basketball to them, who Michael Jordan is, who who will be in the future. Amazing. I think it's quite, I think Ski Boots is a good shout, actually. Yeah, no, I, I'm just astounded. Just I'm, shocked I'm, by I'm shocked by there's that. No, yeah. there's, no deep, there's, no there's no real no deep reason. No, no, I like it. Yeah. 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 And the good thing is you probably have got a pair of Ski Boots, yeah. haven't you? So, yeah. uh, Somewhere probably. Yeah. 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 So uh, that's good. Well, excellent. Simon, I refer to it as tripe. But I think that that is actually quite demeaning to cow's stomachs. But in any case, that was... Simon's Random Question. And so, George, there we have it. Episode one of season three of the Take It Pew podcast is in the rather strange bag. Thank you for having us here in Scotland. 
And thank you for being on the show. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I've never met a group of people who write a jingle better than you guys. So thank you very much. <laughs> and dear listeners, thank you for tuning in. As they say on this type of thing, don't forget to like and subscribe wherever you listen. We've got a great lineup of guests coming your way, but in the meantime, it's Toodle Pip from me. And Tatty Bye from me. Join us again next time as we take, take a pew. pew.